Okay. Hey. Hi. Hello. So new Stellaris came out, right? Uh, 3.0 is out, and it's fine. It's fine. Um, it's not mind blowing. Some of the patch stuff and balance tweaks and performance improvements are noteworthy, and you know maybe I'll go off on them some other time. Um, but like 3.0 itself, is pretty lackluster. The whole become the crisis thing is incredibly shallow and boring, and like iterates off of previous uh, things introduced to the game, like planet cracking, and just draws it up to an extreme. And I, you know, it's super pretty, but it's not balanced by any means, and it's really not that interesting. Like, at all. Like, it's easy enough to dominate the AI. I play with, uh, enhanced AI mods, and I play on the hardest difficulty. And I still steamroll the AI consistently. They just, they're never gonna be up to, up to par. So, if they're the crisis, no big deal. If you're the crisis, I, I mean, at that point, you've already won anyway. I don't really enjoy the whole map painting genocidal arc that a lot of Stellaris players like. For that crowd, I think they'll get a lot of enjoyment out of the, the uh, power fantasy. The Imperium thing is fun enough, but again, the diplomacy is shallow enough, and the AI is... It's just too stupid. It's too stupid and shallow, and it doesn't have, like, depth and believability. It's it's very clearly just, like, a thin facade slapped on top of an algorithm that's just trying to keep up. But that's not what I'm here to bitch about today, because I bitch about that all the time. Today, I want to talk about species traits. I want to talk about species traits and determinism. Uh, determinism is... In this context, what I'm referring to is the tendency in fiction, particularly in fantasy and science fiction genres, to describe a people or a species by specific traits. Vulcans are strong and logical. Klingons are strong and honorable. Uh, Romulans are intelligent and devious. Changelings are xenophobic and shapeshifters, right? You, you get these kind of traits that really narrow down what they're like. And so in Stellaris, we, we have something vaguely somewhere in the species traits. What's What's troubling about this tendency is, especially when we uh, talk about tabletop role-playing games, all orcs are evil. Really? Like, that's some weird deterministic crap. Uh, if, if all orcs are evil, or all goblins, or whatever are evil and they are sentient things even devils even demons if they're they're sentient things and they're all evil therefore a good person is totally justified in wiping them out or killing them off or doing a genocide that doesn't sit well with me now stars doesn't go in quite that direction but that uh that comparison really sets the tone for my attitude, generally, when it comes to species traits uh, across the board, not just with this particular game. With Stellaris, unfortunately, so many species traits boil down to passive modifiers, and generally pretty underwhelming passive modifiers. So if you're playing this as a game, as many of the, uh, it's, I would say the vast majority of the Paradox community is want to do. Uh, they min-max the hell out of everything, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. Like, uh, here's, <laughs> new trait, who determined? Like, when I played 3.0, I played as this faction. I made the Scions of Samsara, and they're humans, but they're intelligent communal conservationist 
deviant sedentary because mechanically this is a good set to start with but i wanted to tonight think about and talk about a little bit the traits and like if they would really apply i I don't really have an end goal in mind, which is a terrible place to start, right? Uh, <laughs> but um, in science fiction and in all fiction, it's it's really important to understand this conceptualization that we have no idea what alien is, right? In the same sense that we don't you literally do not know what zero is zero does not exist nothing does not exist there is just something or the absence of something but nothing is just a concept it's conceptual in that same kind of framework everything conceptual that we have is through a human lens human beings made it up or thought of it or dreamt it or whatever else unless there happen to be some ideas or traditions or traits passed down from uh, neanderthal ancestors or other hominid species when we were evolving but by and large human experience is the lens and human reality is the lens by which we see the world experience the universe and we write about these things so even even when People are trying really hard to come up with weird ideas that are not human, to see the way in a not human way. Um, we we fall pretty easily and consistently into just making fantasy races or fictional races human tropes, <laughs> uh, often racist tropes at that. Um, you have Vulcans or Elves, which are just a very thin veneer for, like, some pretty racial supremacist, supremacist shit. And, like, uh, Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, was not very uh, bashful about his admiration at, for Vulcans as being better than us. That was the original conceit in the same way that Tolkien would had such a fucking hard on for the elves which were really you know vague stand-in for attitudes towards nordic people at those times human but big big titty cat girls Dude, we can we can talk about furries like why big titty cat girls have two titty and not what like six or eight why why <laughs> explain this furries Be because anthropomorphization uh, is the appeal. Anthropomorphized whatever. Uh, whether it's anthropomorphized concepts, like I'm talking about, uh, that we cannot get out of our own lens, or if we're joking about furries, then if, if you are, take this as lighthearted as possible. You just want to be a genetically modified human, and you know, I'm, I'm cool with it, but a lot of the traits that are still sexualized or desirable or whatever are still like deeply naturally selected for and socially selected for in human culture and human history do i need to send you pics of the hyena oces with pseudo penises i mean need is a strong word do you feel that you need to also i probably seen them before um the fact that I can't remember what you're talking about means I probably haven't, but I, I can I can use my imagination. Um, there's an exception. There, there's sometimes in science fiction there's an exception to this kind of laziness. Um, oh my god, Firefly science. Oh, that's not gonna help. Um, it's not Firefly. It's a uh, Oh, fuck. This isn't going to help. It's not Firefly. Uh, Lightning Bug? Nope. Okay, okay. There's a science fiction series written by... You know what? Let's just keep Google. Science... 
science. I misspelled science as fiction. I combined science and fiction into one word. Science fiction, um, marine biologist. Not Michael Crichton. So there's a marine biologist who wrote a... This sounds like the uh, Persona soundtrack. Um, it's not. Uh, basically, it, it explores... It gets really weird. Uh, humanity's first contact is with a hive mind. That's not really a hive mind in the traditional, like, they talk as a swarm or aliens or whatever. But they act more like certain basic marine life uh like corals and have a group intelligence in the way that network computers do one on its own can't do very much but if you start putting them together they start ascending to sentience or even past that and this sort of communal intelligence hive mind is a really cool concept but even that and even when we talk about networked intelligences or ascended intelligences or you know, whatever else, even even these far flung examples are theorized and conceptualized and dreamt of by human experience and covered by human experience. I am making this long drawn out point just to say that none of this shit is alien. All of this is human that you can come up with examples of cultures or societies or individuals within the human species that exemplify all of these traits. Um, Man, I swear it's something like fire. It's not Firefly. I know that. Google's like, did you mean Firefly? I'm like, I definitely didn't. Mm. Yeah, it's it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, so so are human beings agrarian? Yeah. Yes, human beings are agrarian. Uh the vast majority of the human population still doesn't live in cities and probably won't for quite some time we have a deep connection to the land and make expert farmers and gardeners yeah yeah uh some cultures more so than others but we're we're definitely agrarian uh, is that our defining trait no because we're not only agrarian are human beings ingenious we're good at thinking outside the box and know how to maximize efficiency of infrastructure and power grids. We can be ingenious, just like we can be agrarian. And we can be industrious. Members of this species are known for diligent, hardworking nature and always going above and beyond. Yeah, I mean, certain individuals can be. As a whole? No. I, I mean, I'd say no. But, like, I don't know. I hate this shit. I hate this, uh... I'm gonna keep going, but... I hate how eugenicist this is. That certain traits are just objectively good, other traits are just objectively bad. There's no, like, gray area. There aren't sliders or percentiles. It's just, like... Intelligent. The species is highly intelligent, enjoys faster technological progress. Than what? Than average, right? But what is average? We only have our own experience to go from. As far as we are aware, and by our standards, human beings are the most intelligent form of life in the universe. Until proven otherwise. Now, it's hypothesized there, you know, maybe species that are more technologically advanced than us. And we can create synthetic intelligences or artificial intelligences that have more efficient processing power or faster processing speed better memory storage capability than we have but intelligence as a word is so flimsy and shallow and 
non-specific that this can mean whatever the fuck you want it to mean. Is it the lefty ideology tier list all over again? I love it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here for it. And basically, yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I like intelligent because I like tech. But I don't... I, w I want immersion. I want to feel like I'm making good or believable choices and i don't know like all of these are and aren't at the same time this bugged me since stellaris came out thrifty members of this species are extinct instinctively economical and are always looking to make a good profit whatever corners need cutting now to me this is a cultural thing it, this is so fucking interesting to me because some things in here strong very strong are physical are, are biological things in what world is there a part of your genome that makes you a good farmer in the same way that there are sections of dna that make it easier for people to put on muscle mass or harder for them to lose weight or better at running long distances as far as human beings go really the one of the only remarkable truly remarkable things about our species is our ability to run long distances. Not fast, but endurance runners. We are one of the best endurance running species on the planet. Um, and I mean, obviously, the whole intellect thing, but before our brains developed, we were probably just really good endurance runners. <laughs> what do you mean, Alex? You don't believe in the capitalist gene? I mean, that's, that's kind of what this is saying, right? And what what's really important to narrow this in, this isn't... Our government and ethics right those are separate things and that's the ethics of our government and that can change over time but the traits you have can only be changed through genetic engineering in game i find it really i, I don't know i might even go so far as to say that this is kind of this is a Jewish trope, right? Right? Ah, they're so thrifty. Maybe don't put that as a trait, dude. Maybe don't do that. Maybe don't, maybe don't do that. Like, whenever you talk about genetic engineering, whenever you talk about eugenics, whenever you talk about any of this shit, you're treading murky water. Especially when you are a Nordic company based out of a country that was neutral in the second world war i'm just saying sweden doesn't have the best track record with racism and superiority complexes right they leaned pretty hard into the whole nordic superiority thing until germany lost and then tried to act like they didn't cultural differences are based on genes insert rant about black people and fbi crime statistics here yeah yeah i no no I, like no it, it just make these physical traits make it tall strong uh nocturnal diurnal uh fast metabolism slow metabolism you you should never have something like thrifty or I, I, really thrifty is one of the weirdest one conservationist is really weird uh because this is a cultural thing. You should never have those mixed in with rapid and slow breeders. Like these, yeah, that's a genetic imperative thing. And humans are actually pretty remarkable amongst mammals. We can uh, reproduce all year round. We don't have, you know, heat. We don't have cycles of intense sexual activity and long dormant periods they're based on seasonal calendars now we do have our own biological clocks and uh things that inform when we want to have children or might be more inclined to reproduce but actually as far as species go and um right, harry turtle doves world war or um was it world war i'm gonna say it was world war the the, the world war ii aliens invade book series uh he makes a point of exploring this a little bit in that, that by most standards, 
human beings are rapid breeders. Now, when we think about rapid breeders, there's even a picture of a dragonfly here. We think about fish spawning. We think about mice or rats. We think about insects, ants, bees. We, we think about creatures that are able to spawn dozens or hundreds uh, from a single mating pair. Yeah, that's pretty rapid. So again, some granularity on this would be really nice. Not slow and fast, or slow, normal, and fast, right? But like a sliding scale of intensity. Oftentimes, you know, these, um, we're one of the fastest non-letter fuckers. It's true. Uh, one of the accompanying things of being a rapid breeding species is typically a shorter lifespan. Now, you can pick fleeting, but they're not interlinked. When biologically, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they are interlinked. That certain things come at a cost, you know, evolutionarily, at least in with respect to our, our biosphere here on Earth. There are trends, like um, apparently crabs are the perfect life form and just evolve over and over and over identically across millennia, and it's deeply disturbing. But outside of that, like whales reproduce incredibly slowly. Elephants, very, very slowly. Because they're fucking big. On the flip side, they live a long goddamn time. A long goddamn time. Also, they don't get cancer. Why? Because they're so big. The, the cancer just eats itself because before it becomes deadly. That's incredible, dude! So, they're big, slower metabolism, slow breeder, and long lifespan. That's pretty dope. Human beings have amongst animal species that we know of one of the longer lifespans so it would be fair to say that we're enduring by default especially again the frame of reference is important here what's normal is human normal is uh in fiction right the shared understanding of baseline typically is human is normal so by that logic we should as playing humans have no traits because we're all of these things, but we're not really particularly any of these things. So therefore, we should have none of these things. Right, that's kind of my takeaway. Perhaps the issue is they choose poorly on the naming option or badly translated it. No, no, it's not a bad translation. <laughs> uh, Paradox, uh, they're very intelligent, very literate very clever people uh, i think really the the larger issue is this is set in stone this has been in the game for so long that meaningfully adjusting and changing this it's just too late in the development cycle i i think there's a lot of philosophical things that they wanted to get get across and let you explore and let you change and didn't really have a good way to fit in in the systems that they had like, Thrifty particularly, it, it's one of the standouts here. Like, Thrifty really doesn't make sense here. Uh, they've added traits, but they've never removed anything from this list. And I think Conservationist, these two just fit the least to me. Paradox is first and foremost an English-speaking company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and it's just a design philosophy thing. I, I'm not saying it's bad, just I have questions. Because if you, you take the logic of it to its extreme, there start being some inconsistencies. And I, I thoroughly believe you can make a good system and not take it to its logical extreme. I'm, I'm doing very little of value here, but I'm contributing next to nothing of value by doing this. It's just something that eats away at the back of my brain when I look at systems like this and rather than like sit here alone and just stare at this and make a long list of like maybe this maybe that i thought i'd bitch about it for a while so that's that's really the end goal today is just to complain uh, <laughs> um like i imagine for me 
an agrarian species, a species evolved to be good farmers. So like, when I think of that, I think, um, ants? Ants are incredibly agrarian. Ants have aphid farms. Ants are, uh, pretty socially advanced creatures, but okay, biologically evolved to be agrarian. It's weird, right? Because, uh, the agrarian revolution was one of the first major developments as a uh, species that really started setting humanity apart, not just in our propensity for tool use, but set us apart from most other species in our impact on the planet. There are, I, I think, ants are really the only species I know of beyond us that engage in any sort of farming at all. Right? But if you were to design a species to be a good farmer, I'd give it clawed appendages like a, like a mole or an anteater so that it could dig and till the soil. I'd make it big, probably like the size of a horse or a mule, uh, so it had the endurance and strength to till a whole field but it would also need at the same time the kind of dexterity necessary to handle seed and plant that seed so maybe instead of claws you could have a horn would be pretty impractical but some sort of similar um dense material whether it be claw or a spike or something like that like that 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 sounds like an agrarian species it's not evolved to go fast it's not evolved to go far it's involved to have endurance be able to it would need pretty good eyesight and depth perception i guess to tell the difference between different species of plant probably like a, a herbivore diet right herbivorous diet and like diet isn't even a thing that enters into the species trait but there are huge huge physiological differences between species that evolve towards an inclination towards herbivorism and carnivor carnivorism <laughs> uh carnivores tend to have front-facing eyes and herbivores tend to have eyes on the side of their head and if you look through there's a better way to do this if you look through the species profiles this is a thing that goes unmentioned but eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward forward big eye in the middle of their head this would be an evolutionary dead end eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward eyes forward no eyes so i'll accept two of these fit and it is humanoid, uh, a physical type, uh, typically referred to in science fiction as the type, the type. Also, there's a probably a sweet side, uh, sweet spot since being big, <laughs> big. I'm like, what is big, Alex? You know what big means? It means a higher caloric intake. Yeah, there's probably a sweet side spot. And like I said, ants are great farmers, and their co uh, caloric needs are significantly lower than ours. When we start thinking in terms of scale, uh, on our planet, I'd probably pick an insect to be an agrarian biological tool. If I had to, like a swarm of insects, would they're the most effective at devouring, so they'd probably be the most effective at supporting agriculture. I mean, and they kind of are aphids. Um, sorry, ladybugs, not aphids, are great in purging potentially dangerous species from crops. Uh, you look at worms and certain nematodes, they're really, really, really important for rejuven rejuvenating the soil and breaking down biological material. Like, those are naturally agrarian. But the fact that we don't talk about diet at all, and, you know, in humanoid, we have mostly front-facing than even even in mammalian front-facing i 
think this is still front facing. I'll give you a 50-50 on this. Side facing. These are herbivores. If the rule carries and it does. Front facing, carnivore. Herbivore. Herbivore because that's what pigs look like. I don't think they thought this through. Herbivore because that's what sloths look like. Same. Front facing. Front facing? I mean, the, uh, the artists. And this is really just an artist following a trope kind of thing. One eyes to face the front because it makes a better profile. It makes a more uh, with human <laughs> uh, pattern recognition programming. It makes it easier for us to say that's a face or to recognize something or read emotion. That's why eyes are so important for these graphic designers. But it's it's a really important biological trait too. Even even the turtles are mostly front facing. Turtles eyes are more like here. Front 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 front. What? Hold up. Side ish. Crocodilian. So side dish. Front front. Maybe. Do you even have eyes? They're tiny. If you do. I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but you, you see I'm establishing a trend. Then you, then you get some weird fucks. And honestly, these are some of my favorites, which is the, uh, like, clearly no Star Trekiness going on. It's just something completely different. These, for example, are one of my fucking favorite because this is truly, I mean, there's a lot of inspiration from terrestrial life but non-human terrestrial life. Some of these have no eyes so massive, their front, side, and back. Yeah. <laughs> I can see everything. My point is, when we're talking about evolutionary traits that have a real determination in the lifestyle, physical characteristics, and abilities and tendencies of a species, diet is where it starts. Because... All species need energy to survive, whether they are photosynthetic. I almost said photovoltaic. Uh, whether they're, they're fungus or plants, reptiles, birds, mammals, humans, or even machine. Step one is how do I stay alive? How do I perpetuate my existence? And energy tends to be that thing. By tends to me, I mean it is that thing. So the consumption and processing of energy is where I think you start species creation. Do they primarily sift nutrients out of seawater near hydrothermal vents? Are they photosynthetic? Do they eat photosynthetic things? Do they eat the things that get nutrients out of the volcanic vents? Do they leach nutrients out of the soil or are they able to get energy from naturally radioactive compounds and a very slow metabolism system? I don't know, do something crazy. They have naturally occurring cold fusion that they run off of. Like we can get some really weird, wacky science fiction options here and people have done good, hard academic work to dream up some of these possibilities. That's interesting. Like, absolutely, I want to talk about that and think about that because human, uh, you know, I know where to go there. Spore, and I know Spore is a terrible game uh, in comparison to what it could have been and should have been. Spore starts there. Spore, question number one, is your single-celled organism from which you are going to grow an entire species, is it carnivorous or herbivorous? Because that determines your play style from there on out. Even even in Stellar, uh, Spore, when you got to the space era phase and it was bad. Trust me, I remember. Carnivorous species got bonuses to things involving aggression, warfare, conflict. Whereas herbivorous species got bonuses to diplomacy. To talking skills. I don't know. That makes sense. That that logically carries. And it's not like 
in this context, there's a lot of human bias because we do both. So starting there, you can get some really interesting traction. Then talk about size. Um, Old Man's War is a great example of this. Intelligent life is not contingent on being roughly three meters. Hold on, two and a half meters? Two and a half, three meters? No, three meters is a very tall person. Two meters tall, right? Nothing about being intelligent that determines that. Uh, we've seen signs of surprising intelligence in birds that are this big. Or uh, cephalopods that get this big. Right? So being approximately human size, living in approximately human sized cities, going around in ships that would fit a human being, not really necessary. In um, Lovecraft was a racist, backward ass motherfucker, but he had some really interesting ideas when he was talking about, oh god, I forget which story this was, going into a desert, discovering an ancient non-Euclidean city there, and finding spaces that he's the, the character's human form couldn't squeeze into, that, that is what it's like to interact with an alien species. Because literally the way that they engage with the world is not designed for you, is not meant to allow you access. In the same way that a dog in an office building can't get out of a single office. We have to make doggy doors and cat doors or leave the doors open for them. Or to a gnat, my apartment is the whole world. You can do so much cool and creative shit in science fiction when it comes to... to even Star Trek did this a little bit with Cetacean Ops. Uh, a uh, <laughs> navigational center on... Uh, constitution class starships where dolphin and whale crew members could help with navigation i'm not making this up it, you know the 70s and 80s were a weird time 90s too were a weird time and they're like i'll oh, throw some fucking dolphins on that spaceship because naturally the, the you wouldn't mm. it's just so half-assed but it's it's constrained, right? It I'd be I'd be so okay with Stellaris taking the Star Trek way out and just being like, well, uh, oops, looks like we're all genetically engineered by some ancient precursor race, and that's why we all look the same. You know what? It's a cop out. But it's a good excuse for limiting the scope of what traits you do and do not have, why just about everything looks bipedal, why everything's about the same height, why different species can use the same infrastructure, architecture, buildings, ships, why they can reproduce cross species, right? Like, touches tips. I, I just... The, the, <laughs> the, um, what the fuck is this word I'm struggling with? The context matters. The context really, really matters. None of these words mean a thing without context. I'm wasteful, right? I'm, I'm Amer American, right? We produce more waste per capita than I think any other nation on earth. And I... You know, I recycle a lot and I try to cut down on my use, but uh, for a human being, I am wasteful. Are human beings exceptionally wasteful? Well, we have this attitude that grew up out of the uh, uh, kind of corporate funded conservative uh, conservationist movement of the 20th century that, uh, well, we're destroying the planet because we're so wasteful. Not actually true. We're destroying the planet because massive companies producing incredible amounts of pollution 
<laughs> gas emissions and etc are allowed to go on unstopped because it's profitable for them to do so but then they'll donate money to fund public information campaigns to make us believe that it's an individual responsibility when it's a collective responsibility that we're failing. So is our species wasteful? No, I think capitalism is wasteful. Me fucky alien have babby sci-fi writers, right? Like for fuck's sake, we can't fuck any. Okay. We seem to have found the only other species on our planet we could fucking have a baby with, and we did it. So, you know, there's a will, there's a way, right? <laughs> there's evidence that, uh, uh, I mean, we, we interbred with Neanderthal, so I, if we could do it again, I'm sure we would. And conservationist. Members of the species believe resources must be conserved and recycled. This is not an intrinsic biological drive. There's not a species on this planet that places conservationism above individual energy consumption. Deer, deer, if you take wolves and other predators that would predate on wolves out of a given area and you make it so that hunters cannot hunt within that area, deer will reproduce past the point that the biosphere is able to sustain them. Deer will reproduce to the point where they destroy the ecosystem. All species will do this until they get caught by Malthusian economics, where they run out of food, then they die off, then they start growing back because the food supply can grow back. They, they follow that illogical train in the same way that we do when we don't think about it. No species is naturally conservationist. This is just some fucking weird bullshit. This is a social trait. This is a social trait. These are social values. These are not like decadent. Decadent. Decadent is a biological trait. It is like really... This might as well say degenerate for the kind of coding and messaging that this is accomplishing. This might as well say degenerate. What in the fuck? Why? Why would- no. No. <laughs> Give me sci-fi where you gotta get pegged by aliens because they ain't got no dicks. Sci-fi? What are you talking about? There are plenty of people who uh, say that they were probed by aliens. It's nothing fictional about it. <laughs> Western degeneracy gene? Yeah, like, what the fuck is this? Ah, uh, yes, you make... This species believes that wherever there's hard work that needs to be doing, that work is always best done by somebody else. That's a social value. That's a cultural value. It, that's a... I mean, position of privilege, obviously, but that is not biological. And it's just so fucking weird to me that biological and abiological, non-biological social traits are mixed into the same thing and kind of thrown in the thresher together. Now, now to be fair, it still kind of makes sense that you would use your social science or biological science, you know, your green points to revise or change or modify these. Right? It does. Because... Uh, a social reformation would be necessary and has been necessary to take, I don't know, rapid breeding populations and remove that trait. Human beings have the potential to have dozens of offspring. We don't always do that, though, because of a social and cultural value and change. So the system sort of makes sense. I think, though, there's just so much more depth that you could have here and so much more substance you could have than the system really uh, conveys and really gives us access to. And I understand the difficulty of more depth and more complexity is, I mean, frankly, the AI. The AI is the reason why we can't have nice things or the reason why we can't have nicer things it, it really does come down to the fucking ai not being able to play the goddamn game it comes down to the ai is bad and stupid and doesn't understand these things 
Yeah, yeah, what, okay, so, so quick fire. Are we agrarian? No. Ingenious? No. Industrious? No. Intelligent? I, arguably, yes, but probably no. Thrifty? No, we are not natural engineers. What does it even mean to have a natural inclination towards material sciences? Like, like that species of snail that has iron in their shell so they can survive volcanic environments? They seem like natural engineers, but they didn't choose to do that, and I don't think the snail understands that the, uh, the ferrochemicals in its shell are allowing it to conduct heat away from its body and back into the water so it doesn't die. I don't think the mollusk understands that, even though if it were to gain intelligence, that would be a huge boon to its understanding of, you know, natural engineering. I don't think it knows. Natural physicists? No. I Honestly, if anything, I think we're natural sociologists. Um... Which, obviously, I'm a historian and an anthropologist, so uh, of course you think everyone else is. But, you know, religion um, and other social and political constructs and affiliations are so much of how we define ourselves and have defined ourselves and characterized ourselves for, for generations. Uh, when, when I think of sociology, I also think of literature. I think of art. I think of, even though literature and art would be... Where the fuck is it? Um, traditional, in this sense. God. God the fuck. Fucking hell. <laughs> oh, um, sociology, huh? Are you, uh, you're studying the way that societies work? Yes. So you study art? Whoa, no, 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 no. I don't do influence, man. I don't make unity. I make sociology points. Okay, so you, you research the way that societies interact? Yeah. But without art? Yeah. And you don't do it in a way that's politically or socially impactful. Yeah. What? What the shit kind of system? Yeah. I get unity is like social cohesion, but it's not even social cohesion. It's a really weird thing. The, the abstractions are what drives me fucking insane. Uh, we're adaptive, right? But are we biologically adaptive? No, we are socially adaptive. We've created tools that allow us to adapt to in different environments. And given that all these other species have access to fast and light technology, I don't think that humanity would be more adaptive to different biomes than any of these species. Now, we don't die the minute that we set foot in a tundra or savanna, but we live in a pretty temperate planet. I don't think we are particularly adaptive. In fact, we're fairly non-adaptive. Human beings freeze really easily, and we get super overheated very easily. We dehydrate in uh, unremarkable spans of time. We don't hold fat or water for, for the obscene amounts of time that other species like camels do on our planet. So we're not particularly adaptive. We just live we we're good improvisers but improvisational isn't a thing in here <laughs> i think uh you know quick learner might fit improvisational are we talented members of the species are born with a natural aptitude toward what yes human beings are often born with natural aptitudes each of us have different aptitudes that we might be more naturally inclined to, and I think this would hold true to all species. Uh, if they are of a rough equivalent development biologically, which is a weird thing to say, as humanity. Aren't we quick learners? Yes. Right? Uh, the... Uh, yes and no. Um, how long does it take a horse to learn how to run? They are born knowing how to walk. Colts will hit the ground running, literally. Human beings struggle with learning how to walk for a year. And then struggle with language for their entire lives. <laughs> so, in some way, we are quick learners, right? We, we can pick up new things, uh, especially memes. We're very quick learners with memes and games. 
And if there's any kind of reward structure, human beings are very good at learning new things. But we've shown in studies, so are birds, so are monkeys. If you provide a reward structure, then the part of your brain that goes, if I do this, I get reward, is activated. I think human beings aren't, probably aren't all that good at being quick learners. We've just learned how to game our, uh, our natural feedback loops and metagame the system, min-max our, <laughs> our biological functions. It, it really does feel that way to me. So I don't, I don't think we're, like, there's an argument that we're slow learners. Like, shit. Generation after generation have been telling us that capitalism is destroying the planet, that capitalism is doing this and doing that, doing this and doing that. And now we know it, right? We have the science that proves it. We have decades of study, centuries of evidence and arguments. And yet... We're not really changing, but I don't think that's because we're slow learners. I think that's because we're stubborn. But stubborn isn't really a trade in here. It is in CK2 and CK3. And I think that'd be a great trade in here. So, okay, we're stubborn. Traditional. Now, at a glance, I'd say we're not traditional. Because I associate the word traditional with religious. Certain aspects of the species' cognition makes it predisposed to especially value historical precedence and group unity. It's a weird way to phrase it, but it's important how they're phrasing this. They're not just saying they have traditions, but aspects of the species cognition. You are naturally biologically inclined to value historical precedence and group unity. A biological creature has no concept of history. If it does, that they, you have like genetic memory, and that's fucking incredible. History is an entirely conceptual thing. It doesn't exist. It doesn't materially exist. In, in the same way that nothing, as I talked about earlier, doesn't exist. History is a concept. Unity is a concept. There are no natural biological conditions or responses or traits that lend themselves to historical precedence or group unity because group unity and historical precedence are flexible conceptual things that can mean and be whatever the fuck you want them to be depending on the context but it, it, it doesn't fucking mean anything are we quarrelsome well, not inherently distrustful, Member this is, members of this species are often socially combative. So when, when you can flip traditional and quarrelsome, traditional, I'm like, this isn't a real thing. Like, literally, this isn't a real thing. Quarrelsome? This is a real thing. But I would, I would make quarrelsome and docile opposites like docile members of the species are easy to manage and organize they tend to be cooperative and amicable oh okay what's the opposite of being easy to manage and organize being difficult to manage and organize and being uncooperative and one might say quarrelsome like you have quarrelsome and unruly as if those are not synonyms unruly species are difficult to manage and organize Quarrelsome species are socially combative, but not necessarily difficult to organize. They don't like being told what to do and are quarrelsome or questioning. I, I think we're unruly. I I would say we are quarrelsome and unruly as a species. I, we are incredibly socially combative creatures. I think most life, at least through the lens that we understand it most life is quarrelsome most life is combative uh typically it's just through violence through physical violence and through social constructs cultural constructs and millennia of self-moderation we've tried 
to change that physical violence into more often than not social violence and political violence and economic violence and uh, still meaningfully hurtful harmful ways of exacting and enforcing will and power against one another but doing so in a way that's less directly violent yeah i'd say we're quarrelsome pretty inherently but we we're also a communal species right and i'll get to that just because it's difficult to manage and organize people just because we don't like being told what to do and that we often quarrel and question I mean, oh my god, they use the fucking word quarrelsome in the descriptor of unruly. This is such a bad system. Like, it's it's not mechanically, it's sound. Logically, it's just spaghetti on the fucking wall. It doesn't belong there, it looks terrible, and it's all falling apart. It's And it's making a mess doing it. You... One of the most essential rules of communication is when you are describing something, particularly a word, to someone who doesn't understand what this concept is, you do not use the word in its own definition. If I were to ask you, what does the word general mean? I would say general means something average, something approximate, something overall, overarching. I would give synonym, 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 synonym. I wouldn't, when you ask me, what does lazily mean? Say, oh, it's when you're being lazy. I, <laughs> I likewise... On a multiple choice test, which this is a multiple choice test, would not give a descriptor for one thing using the name of something previous in the list in that descriptor. It just, what the fuck is the difference between quarrelsome and unruly? This is the same thing, just different effects of the same thing. I, I don't. I'll keep going, but like, holy fuck, this just pisses me off. Um, very strong. Possess a strength that almost defies the laws of physics. Now that's very specific, right? So very strong is like fantastically strong, like science fiction strong, which is really interesting that it's a trait immediately available, but that traits like uh, uridite aren't available immediately. Just to make biological ascension better and biological ascension is boring like with uh synthetic ascension you become robot people and that's kind of cool even though you can become robots from the beginning but this ascended synthetic ascended ones are better somehow because of pop mechanics and psionics gives you access to mechanics literally in technologies literally no one else has seems really fucking interesting biological ascension if like well, here's some perks because even though you are less technologically developed biologically than these other people you can do it better i don't, I don't know it i don't like it or understand it strong possess great physical strength making them formidable fighters on the ground in comparison to what i i can beat the shit out of a duck that doesn't make me strong and even, like, the most infantile gorilla, not infantile, but, like, beta-ass gorilla would fucking destroy me. Is the duck weak? I'm normal? And the gorilla strong? Right, we need some goalposts here. We need some, some mile markers. We need some indicators of... I'm not asking for Dungeons and Dragons. A strength of 18 is able to lift 538 pounds. I, I, I don't need it that scientific. Though, you know, if you're interested, I do like metrics. Just something. Something. Anything. Context. Uh, weak. Members of the species are physically weaker than average. They, they even fucking use the word here, average. What is average? The unstated assumption. The unstated definition of average 
is not average. Human can be interchangeably used for average in this context because when we conceptualize in science fiction and in fiction, average means human. And if you if you look into the social sciences of it, often as uh, purveyors or creators or consumers of Western media, when we talk about average, what we mean by average is white, male, straight, able-bodied, uh, middle or upper class. That's that's average. That's the average American, for example. It's not the average American is. Uh, lower middle age, woman of color, with a medical condition. What medical condition I couldn't tell you, but like the 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 average American is so far from what the average American is said to be. So, using words like average without defining your terms is it, it's bad and lazy. It's imprecise. It doesn't communicate clearly or coherently what you were trying to convey. It's ineffective communication. And in that, in the gap that your communication, that your laziness, in using this word, then something more specific, in that gap, people can stuff in their own values and a worldview. And I get that's kind of the point, is that Stellaris tries to take a pretty light touch when it comes to world creation so that people can shove whatever bullshit they want in here but paradox again has a very very real cultural problem in their fan base with fascists and neo-nazis a big big problem with people who warp around the ideas of genocide and role-playing germany in world war ii and forming gross deutschland and etc 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 meme all this stuff and aren't memeing like, there is a big part of their community that they are so lazy in addressing that are just the scum of humanity and the worst of the worst people when it comes to thinking about history, sociology, who and what we are, and take the worst lessons from it. The worst lessons. Ultimately... I don't think that the designers and game creators can be held responsible for the people who use their product, but they can be responsible for the ways in which their products allow people to engage in those fantasies, or in their slow and ineffectual efforts to contain or moderate it. For example, uh, an old Stellaris mod still on the um, Steam Workshop I checked the other day allowed for you to play as a single phenotype of human. If you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, if we go into Ruler here, I've installed a mod that adds even more phenotypes. But phenotypes basically come down to race or some other small things, but mostly race. This mod, and there's a couple like it, Remove all except. Oh, I'll let you take a wild guess which phenotypes they keep. Did you guess this one? Because it's this one. It's the white one. Ah, uh, no, it's not a racist mod. No, I just. I don't want to play as anyone who isn't white. And my vision of the future is just all white people with no explanation. Like, come the fuck on! The mod's been up there for years at this point and hasn't been removed. What in the hell? You can also get, you know, big titty mods, and I'm all about those because, you know, why not? Why not? Everybody needs a little big, big titty mod in their life. But a uh, big titty mod isn't removing a race of human beings from existence or editing or literally whitewashing their existence out, right? I think if you have a system like this and you are lazy enough to throw words around like average, if you can talk about purging or talk about cultural conversion or talk about all of these other things that Paradox just throws into their game without much of a note about what exactly it means and tries to paint as vaguely and beigely as possible, 
without taking any real responsibility for the implications of the subject matter, for the audience's interpretation of that subject matter, and how these representations of that subject matter go on to impact and form people's worldview, if you were going to be that lazy, ineffectual, and really dangerous as a content creator, I'm going to bitch about it. I'm going to say that you need to do better. Because you can, it isn't hard. Context is so fucking important. Both for talking about things historically, but also in talking about the future. Which is really what science fiction is. Utopia and dystopia. Conceptually, for, for art, for media, for storytelling utopia and dystopia science fiction you know pillars are ways that we characterize and make a characterization of a current trend or possibility or thing uh, 1984 government surveillance for example is the big takeaway that people have even though it was satire and the guy who wrote it was a communist and yeah, people tend to take it the exact opposite way that he intended and it was really in his mind a uh, condemnation of how everyone watched tv all the time it's it's a fucking bad book um 1984 just as an example was was his attempt to talk about how people who were doing what baby boomers meme I was just looking at your dang cell phones all the time and not connecting with the real world and so people on the TV are lying to you but you you're not going out and touching grass so you don't understand and yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's just boomer 101 before they were boomers book right but instead of going on and the bitchy aren't kids today these kids are the worst kind of way it draws up a fantasy where it takes something to a logical extreme, and in that logical extreme, we're able to look at it in a more, uh, maybe not nuanced way, but in a way that makes it feel bigger or easier to get our point across. Um, Edward Bellamy, oh my god, what the fuck did he write? I, I want to say Back to the Future, that's, that's not what Edward Bellamy wrote. Uh, Bellamy... Yeah, English author. Looking backward, close enough. Looking backward is an a novel is a strong word. It it's uh I, I mean they're calling it a novel. Looking backward is pretty short. I 470 pages? Alright, it's longer than I thought it was. Looking backward is a utopian novel from the late 1800s by Edward Bellamy. Edward Bellamy was a uh socialist of the uh of the time period american socialists of the east coast white east coast middle upper class so you know a certain brand of socialism um very academic privileged socialism i'd say looking backward was one of the most pivotal works of science fiction in the american tradition it, it went on to influence so many science fiction authors and the genre in a way that really goes underappreciated. And the way Bellamy did it was through a pretty bad story. It was a story about a guy who fell asleep in his house. And it, he fell asleep in his basement or some shit. There was an earthquake. People thought he was dead. And then he was unburied in the year 2000 like it it does not make sense am i remembering this right yes he falls into a deep hypnosis induced sleep and wakes up 113 years later it's not a good story it's not a good story it's about how a guy in the 1800s fell asleep wakes up in the future and it's a socialist utopia where no one wants for anything people have jobs that they want that they're good at that contribute to society everybody does what they're good at a lot of things are shared there's no private ownership anymore there's still you know personal property but no private property it was a really effective way of communicating what socialism was to americans at the time it was so successful 
uh, a group of fans of Edward Bellamy's started the Bellamite movement, where people went and started little communes trying to hurry about this future that Edward Bellamy wrote about. Now, he did write a sequel to Looking Backward that was terrible. Oh my god, there's like a million ripoffs of it. But just as an example, when we're talking about utopia or dystopia, when we're talking about science fiction particularly, when we are talking about the future of humanity conveyed in a fictional format, saying, lol, it's just fiction. Oh, it's just the story. Just have fun with it. It's lazy, naive, and juvenile. As a creative force, you need to take responsibility for what you are making and the way it is making an impact on the world around you because no art is politically inert. No action is politically inert, certainly, but no art is politically inert. To be an artist is to be political. And if you are trying your best to be apolitical in being an artist, what you are doing is being a conservative. What you are doing is being a moderate. If you are trying to not make a statement, you are just enabling people who are more willing than you are to use your words to make a statement. You will be used by fascists <laughs> very easily. So anyway, yeah, uh, humanity, are we nomadic? Species has a nomadic past and its members often think of nothing but relocating to another world. I mean, that's true, humans. I guess. I mean, some of us, those of us who buy this game, at least find the idea of interstellar travel or inter solar travel even appealing. But I don't think that's necessarily a human thing. I mean, the vast majority of humanity aren't nomadic. It's not like we go on... Uh, there's this thing that used to be more popular in the United States around the turn of the 20th century, uh, in the 1920s, 30s particularly, was when a young man or woman of means came of age in the United States, you would take the tour. The tour being a tour of uh, Western Europe, major European capitals, that you'd go around Europe and become worldly that way. Uh, I Typically, you'd do this prior to going off to college or university, or if you were a young woman, prior to getting married. Uh, the idea behind this was that going around in these travels would make you a better, more well-rounded human being. And, you know, uh, studies show that that sort of thing works. Really, it was a very classed rite of passage. My point is, we don't have that rite of passage as everyone. The vast, 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 vast majority of humanity is born, grows old, and dies within 100 square miles. People are, we have the propensity as a species to be nomadic. Individually, as members of that species, we are not nomadic. What we are, are stubborn. <laughs> we're survivors. We'll go to where we can eke out a living once we're pushed out by other forces, more often than not other people. I don't think that people are nomadic. I really don't. Yeah, we've made our way all around this planet, but you know who did it first? Crabs. <laughs> would you describe crabs as nomadic no but crabs cover more of the planet's surface than we do is plankton nomadic no but it covers more of the planet's surface than we do like, it, it's such a stupid fucking concept i where this draws from are these maps that we have right these maps of Humanity spreading across the world, starting in Africa and these little arrows going into the Middle East and then into Asia Minor, into the Caucasus, uh, into the Central Asian steppe, into China, into India, into China, showing it going into the Pacific Islands and then showing people looping around into Southern Europe and then later into Northern Europe and then the especially americans you see this all the fucking time when you're in public school like the crossing of the bering strait and people the peopling of the americas and you know we we really like this story at least americans really like this story of how we are 
explorers and colonizers and i think this is why we like this story because we use this as leverage for while it's only natural that europeans came to the new world and settled it and colonized it and conquered it it's what we do we're we're nomadic we're explorers when that's not really why we did it you can explore a place without planting down a flag and slaving the local populace raping people to death, pillaging their cities and wealth, and then condemning them to a subhuman existence for hundreds of years. That's not exploration, that's imperialism. This story about the nomadic history and nomadic origins of humanity and our amazing capacity to have explored so much of this planet when to us it seems like so few other species have it's so often used as leverage for justifying political actions that are unjustifiable. But again, I don't think this level of analysis went into this. I think somebody just isn't a historian, isn't an anthropologist, isn't a real sociologist, isn't doesn't really have any real education in this sort of thing and just kind of picked words out of a bag and so no i would not say we're nomadic are we sedentary species has a sedentary past its members are reluctant to migrate away from where they grew up this is actually true about humanity people who are playing this and you know you you have this cliche uh spacex fanboy right uh what i imagine when i think of a, a stellaris player is um, they like Mass Effect, they like SpaceX, they think Tesla's cool. I, I think of a tech bro, really, when I think of this. I think of someone who just gets off to Elon Musk and his emerald blood money purchasing tech companies and acting like he's saving humanity. That's, that's kind of my takeaway from a lot of the general consumption of science fiction <laughs> uh when in reality we're sedentary half of the world's population lives in china about the other half live in india we're we're like the 15 percent living everywhere else i know it doesn't actually math out that way but the vast majority of people live in east asia and have for a long, 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 long time. Long, long time. People still live in Africa, in the places where we evolved. They never fucking left. Can you say that they're nomadic? What, what does it say when you define humanity as nomadic? What you're doing is you're defining humanity by the people who left Africa, excluding the people who stayed in Africa. Your definition of humanity, if it is a nomadic one, excludes non-European people. It's a, it's a very European, American, colonialist, imperialist worldview to paint our species as nomadic. We're explorers, we're social, we're passion driven we're excitable we like new things sometimes we get a rush out of learning and experiencing new things Ab absolutely but we're also lazy and tired and skittish we just want to stay home and that's as true as the thing that you say in an inspirational voiceover with synth music in the background is you pan across the Milky Way. It's idealistic and troublingly divisive to paint our species as all good or all bad, as all one thing or all another. When human beings have the ability to be incredibly intelligent and incredibly stupid, we have incredible capacity to show strong unity and common fronts, and then particularly as a leftist, I know this well, to crumble into internal fighting and dissent. 
I don't think that the social characteristics can or should be descriptive terms by which we imagine species, especially our own. I think it would be up to another intelligent species to tell us what the fuck we are, because you can't tell for yourself the same way that anyone who's self-diagnosing what mental disorders they have, or anyone who's tried to self-diagnose a disease and then goes to an actual professional to get di diagnosis, they're typically way the fuck off. Yes, you know your body and your brain better than anyone else, but you're in it. You can't get an objective look at it. And so, too, neither can we. Are we communal? Members of the species are highly communal, quite used to living in close proximity to others. Yeah, by and large, we're quite communal. Um, this, you'd have a hard time arguing against. Um, seriously, some of the oldest archaeological evidence of our species shows that we are and have been communal creatures. Uh, even prior to the invention of metal tools, we have evidence that old and... Uh, disabled members of tribes were kept alive chewing food for them like they were baby birds even uh for decades decades from the skeletal remains it looks like people were kept alive when physically they couldn't care for themselves anymore human beings are as a matter of hard fact wildly communal creatures we are incredibly communal which is not to say again that we cannot be solitary individual members of our species tend to be solitary and territorial we're tribalistic i think is a better way of thinking of this um we operate within our communities quite well and we tend to have a great sense of loyalty to what we imagine as our community but we also have a great propensity to unify around what we are not, not just what we are. Often it's a combination of the two. They tend to go hand in hand. Um, we're very communal, but that also makes us more quarrelsome amongst those communities, more unruly when people from outside those communities are trying to organize. We tend to be sedentary because we are communal, and we want to stay near these communities that benefit us and care for us. And when we are outside of those communities, when we do explore, we tend to take on more solitary attitudes. We tend to be more based on self-preservation once you take somebody outside of that context. Human beings are very flexible creatures. Are we charismatic? We have a special charisma and are generally considered pleasant to be around. I mean, I'd say no. Uh, hell is other people <laughs> is a, is a uh, statement for a reason. But generally, in science fiction, humans are portrayed as being relatively charismatic. Even when you have stupid, sexy blue aliens that everyone wants to bang. And I did think that was a very clever thing that Mass Effect did with the Asari and making... All the other species see the Asari through their own lens and see see the Asari differently. That was a very cool touch, and I think that is a perfect example of what a charismatic species is. Still, it's Commander Shepard giving an inspirational speech. Still, it's Captain Jean-Luc Picard in front of the uh, <sighs> Admiralty or in front of his crew speaking passionately and people listening in rapt attention, right? It's Kirk waxing, I'd say poetically, but it's Kirk about the nature of humanity. There's this tendency in science fiction to dress up us up as if we're charismatic. Are we repugnant? Physical appearance and customs of the species are considered offensive to most others, and few appreciate them as neighbors. I don't know. You'd have to ask another species. I know that we are quite often repugnant to ourselves. Europeans, more often than not, were considered repugnant when they visited other places. It's not like they sent their best when they sent explorers and traders. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a toss-up. I'd say charismatic, though. Totally. Conformist. People seek consensus and are more likely to conform to governing ethics. 
I think generally this is true. Um, because, not because we're biological engineered that way, but because we've come up with social tools and means of organizing that are effective in uh, accomplishing and <laughs> encouraging conformity. Okay, so maybe we're deviant. We're rebellious in nature and constantly try to challenge the status quo. Our youth are. I think our youth um, definitely are. We all have this kind of rebellious phase as youth, um, coming to terms with, oh god, reality. But uh, no, no, I don't think humanity is necessarily deviant or conformist. I think if you're playing stars, deviant is a free pick because who gives a shit about ethics attraction? And it's one I tend to go with, but meh. Now, vener venerable, enduring, and fleeting. <sighs> Not relative to what, man? Oh, leader life's plan. Plus 80 years. Plus 80 years relevant to what? Again, the unstated assumption is relevant to human lifespans. But if we were talking about dogs, we're already venerable. If we're talking about goldfish, Jesus Christ, we're venerable. Goldfish actually have pretty decent lifespans in the wild. It's only in captivity that they tend to die off pretty frequently. Uh, for a myriad of reasons. Um, so, no. None of these. Dakinen, we already talked about this. Species, I, I hate that this is a thing. We are resilient in the sense that we're stubborn. But we are not physiological resilient. Right? We... Okay. Um, earlier tonight, I was reading about what kind of gravitational forces a human being can survive under. Generally, the, the high end, it's assumed that if human beings train, we could possibly survive on a planet with three to five times uh three to five g's three to five gravities uh the world record for heaviest lift was somewhere around the equivalent of 5.4 g's but he was deadlifting he wasn't running or walking with this weight on him our, our tibia apparently can hold up under our, our bones are pretty tough stuff they can hold up under a lot of weight it's just uh you don't necessarily want to be in those conditions and like biologically we're not that resilient i i don't even know what an enraged brood mother is to <laughs> defend their worlds like we're not physiologically resilient but humanity would sooner nuke this planet then hand it over to somebody else. Is that resilience? I don't know. I think we should get a <laughs> defense army damage bonus for being willfully self-destructive. Uh, we already talked about conservationist and wasteful. I don't think either of these hold real weight as being biological conditions. I, I, this is uh, Members of the species seemingly have no concept of frugality, as if conceptual... Knowledge is a biological condition. Just this weird-ass intermingling of bi biological traits and social traits and cultural values is the weirdest fucking system. I really, really, really want to like this trait system. I really do. But it's just... It, it, does it know what it is? It does. It does is the answer. It does know what it is. It's a series of passive modifiers that impact the number go up, number go down, paint map, color game. It's not an immersive system to indicate the attitudes, capabilities, tendencies, or behaviors of the species. The game, as much as it acts like, and Paradox acts like, it's a roleplay engine, which at its best, I think it is. It's, these are just game mechanics. These are just buffs. But if you play this game, min maxi, you'll get bored because it's not chess, right? It's not a level playing field. It's, it's not pitting your intelligence and reflexes against somebody else on a 
even plain. It's randomly generated luck that's going to hoist someone over somebody who might arguably be better at the game than they are. It's one of the reasons why I laugh that there's a competitive Stellaris scene. Like, bro, this isn't Star Trek. This isn't Age of Empires. You aren't playing, you know, I get five berry bushes, you get five berry bushes. We start with a scout and three villagers of five or whatever the fuck it is and have more or less a mirrored map. May the best person with the best strategy and best APN win, right? No, Stellaris is just like, oh, you got Cybrex? Guess I'll go fuck myself, right? Oh, you you found a ring world right next to your home world. And then traitors came in and blew up the fleet that was supposed to stop you from colonizing it. Okay, uh, GG, I guess, right? Ha 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 ha. It's, they're no good stars players. There are people who are very good at gamifying it, but I have more fun with this as a roleplay platform. So, I don't know. Here's here's my traits, I guess, for humanity. Intelligent, I, I think, is actually pushing it. I don't really think we are. I gotta lose two of these, and I'd like to equal out at zero, just so we have something vaguely competent. Charismatic kind of sucks, if I'm being real with you. Um, so, I need to lose two negative ones, or the negative two, and a positive one. Are we quarrelsome? We are not inherently distrustful, but socially combative. Yes. Sedentary. I'll toss that out. Sure. I'll get rid of that. Um, okay. It's either, either, either deviant, being rebellious in nature and constantly try to challenge the status quo. Nah, we're not deviant. Some of us are, but not all of us. I think that we're generally unruly and quarrelsome. Even though I do think that we're communal and charismatic. Humanity at its best, I think, is cooperative and amicable. Generally, though, no. No, is that okay? I, I guess this is my pick. Intelligent seems pretty strong. Like, if I wanted to weaken it, I'd probably go with, I don't know, adaptive? Because adaptive, in my books, just sucks. Ooh, you could colonize more planets. Ooh, I don't need to. <laughs> you can you just terraform everything. The AI doesn't terraform stuff. It's again, this is not a competitive game. It's it's not. It's very easy to be good at Stellaris. So I think I'm gonna wrap up here. What do we learn? I, I don't know. The systems like this are like universally disappointing once you start looking at them under a critical lens that uh i generally don't like stuff like this i i want to point to a good example i do mm. okay you know what no what no i have this vocal um Give me that. Give me that. We are going to go look at a tabletop role-playing game. Why are we looking at a tabletop role-playing game? Well, you know, because I can't come up with a video game that does this well. Does that mean that no video games do it well? No! Maybe. I don't think so. Um. It's going to pop up on my right monitor, isn't it? Bam, there it is. All right. Stars Without Number. This is the original Stars Without Number. This is not the new version. The new version is much better, but I'm not showing off the new version because it, buy it. Just buy it. Um, here we go. 137, Alien Creation. I hate you, Adobe, when I hit with mouse. I do not want to go back. There we go. Body type. Bam. Human, bird, reptile, insectile, exotic, hybrid. What does that mean? Got some descriptors here. Humans are of the like. They're they're bipedal. They have all these things. Bird-like features. 
Lizard man to a combination of pebble skin membranes. Da, 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 da. Insects are fucking insects. Exotic can be all kinds of weird things. Well, okay. It, it's not really helpful. We'll get into more specifics later. Then psychology and lenses. Such a great way to talk about worldview. What What's our like psychological lens? Dependent, man. It's wildly dependent. So here you can play them to, to a trope. Like, this is playing on the science fiction trope, and it's very intentional, of, um, Klingons are honorable. Vulcans are sagacious and logical. Romulans are treacherous. Right? Like, it's, it's leaning into that. And here it goes on and explains what things are, what kind of social structure it is. See, these aren't saying these are traits necessarily inherent in what a species is it's just you know possible now if we go down to the actual animals being insectile will you do, do they have jewel covered chitin do they hide themselves ambush prey do they have silk spinnerets do they do they form a chrysalis at some point? Or they have no mouth and adult forms only live to reproduce, like uh, mayflies. And same thing for furred reptilians or eyeless reptilians. Reptilians that spit venom. Mammals that are cold-blooded or have horns or body spikes. Or burrow. Avians that whiffs and drop prey. Or ex <laughs> exhale flames or toxic substances. And exotic animals have wheels or natural laser emitters weird shit this is good science fiction uh but it gets away with this because it's a tabletop role-playing game where this fictional positioning of any of these things can be used in a way that these mechanics which are set in stone don't enjoy that degree of flexibility you have to say well being enduring means you live longer Rapid reproduction means your pops grow faster. When, really, it should mean a lot of different things. You know, a single trait should have like four or five knockoff effect that it also does. I, I think a good way to rework the species traits is to, number one, get rid of all the social values. Yate them. Yate them. Get them, get them, get them out of here. And then add more modifiers to the existing traits and make them more interesting and make them not just good or bad make them good and bad give them a little bit of this take away a little bit of that in the in this same way that ethics sort of are like materialist seems very good right you get research speed robot upkeep but the flip side is and it isn't you know stated at the outset it's much harder to get psionics Authoritarian, um, there's not really anything good about being democratic, actually. <laughs> Paradox really sucks at this, uh, good and bad. It tends to all just be, like, varying degrees of good, and that's not how you make something balanced. You, you have, you give a bonus, and then you set an offset. A uh, tried and true classic example of this is Dungeons and Dragons, where they have different species. And this is a terrible system, by the way. Um, all elves get a plus two to dexterity, some get a plus one to wisdom, some get a plus one to intelligence, right? And uh, whatever. Uh, uh, fuck. Goblins? Get a plus two to dexterity and minus one to two other things, but goblins are able to move through other people which can be quite shifty and disengage can yada 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 get trade-offs tactical choices and decisions the reason a reason why they don't do that is if we uh i'm just gonna screenshot this so i don't have to remember what i'm doing back get, get out of here steam thank you in game what you're playing against are not designed species. You are getting random generated species that you're playing against. So traits can't be both good and bad. 
because the AI, when it comes to genetically modifying its species, knows to remove red traits and add blue traits. But if you make them more complicated than that, you'd have to set up logic of when it's good to add this, when it's good to remove this. And with every line, with every step, with every consideration, if this, then this, weigh this, buy this, if this, this, and this mean time to happen, multiply by this. Slows the game down. 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 Stellaris has so much potential for complexity. And superficially, it's quite complex. But... As a lot of people are complaining about with uh, 3.0, a lot of that complexity gets slowly gutted out in the interest of making the game actually fucking work. And helping the processor actually run the game. So, I'd like a better trait system. I like a more meaningful, engaging, dynamic, deep, properly representative trait system. Am I going to get it? No. But if you're interested in science fiction, especially in creating, writing, or running science fiction in any capacity, I hope some of these things you at least think about. And naturally, I would love to hear your thoughts. I may not, you know, engage with them. Definitely hold the right to be like, haha, cool dog, and move on. But, yeah. Yeah, I've spent probably like it. Oh my god, it's almost been two hours of me bitching about traits. You can tell it's like 3 a.m. and I've been staring at a screen. I was coding for the rest of the day. I was updating my mods. And brother, when you are just copying down planet size equals da da da, orbit angle da da da, for hours. You'll go some places. You'll go some places. But yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up. God bless you people for stopping by. And thank you for hanging out. I, you know, might play an actual game at some point. But <laughs> we'll see, huh? Until later, I'm going to say toodaloo. Take care. And I'll see you then. Bye-bye.